Welcome back to EV News Daily. Coming up today, the EV tipping point is happening quickly all around the world. Uh, Xiaomi reveal their EV, the Su7, and Polestar integrates the Tesla superchargers. Plus, stay tuned, because later in the show, I'll tell you about the 15-year warranty on an EV battery. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or maybe good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. This is EV News Daily, a trusted source of EV information. Last one of the working week, Friday 29th of March today. Goodness, next week is April. Um, I'm Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. We go live at 5 p.m. UK. That's normally midday Eastern with the clock changes happening this weekend in the UK. But either way, it's all academic because I'm late today anyway because it was Good Friday, so the kids are off school. So I was being dad all day today, so I'm working later in the evening to bring you EV News Daily. So sorry it's late. Oh, I should mention Patreon as well, shouldn't I? Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash EV News Daily if you'd like to get the podcast first and add free. Let's talk Mustang Mach-E, should we? All right then. Uh, the 2024 model year. Uh, pricing has leaked in a dealer note, so this isn't an official statement, but we think it's about right. It starts at 39995 to get into the Mustang Mach-E, and that is, I think it's a good deal. The Mustang Mach-E remains a very compelling vehicle. But if you've got 60 grand to blow, you could well get the Rally version, which I'll put on screen right now in a nice lime colour with stripes down the bonnet, and it looks, yeah, it's, it's proper. Uh, the premium trim is priced up by $1,100 compared to the outgoing one. The GT version up by $1,600. And unlike previous years, the Mustang Mach-E won't benefit, at least for now, from the federal tax credit. You only get the partial tax credit anyway of $3,750. Potential future changes to the battery could reinstate that tax credit eligibility. So for now, Ford have taken one for the team and giving you up to $8,500 off themselves on leasing incentives, particularly to try and get you into a Mach-E. Big competitors of this vehicle uh, like the Model Y, do get the tax credit. Model Y qualifies for the $7,500 federal tax credit. And although the Mac e is very special, by the way, uh, is my current... Um you know, recommendation to anyone that asks, particularly in the US, uh, that, you know, if you've got 30 something to spend, get an inventory Model Y, not even the rear wheel drive version, inventory all wheel drive. It's just over 40. And the federal tax credit, if you are eligible, earnings and stuff like that, will take it just over 35 grand because it's, you know, cash on the hood, effectively, it's money off the vehicle now with this new federal tax credit. And just over 35 for an inventory model Y. Admittedly, they're trying to get rid of them. It's the end of the quarter and Tesla in a bit of a bind, actually, in terms of their Q1 deliveries. It's looking, uh, what's the word? Gnarly. However, that means for you, get an inventory pre-built Model Y federal tax credit, thirty-six probably thousand dollars depending on the deals you can find. That is, I mean, it's stellar, isn't it? So pop a link to the show note in the show notes to that Mac E story if you're interested. Well, it's never good news to be talking about cutting shifts, but Ford is reducing the hourly workforce at their Rouge Electric Vehicle Center in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, which makes the Ford F-150 Lightning EV. Well, this decision follows a slowdown in EV sales and reduction in the F-150 Lightning's production was initiated at the beginning of the year. The company reported sales of 24,000 F-150 Lightning trucks last year. According to reports from the Detroit Free Press and the Louisville Courier, out of 2,100 workers at Dearborn, only a third will continue in at least their current roles. 700 or so offered retirement packages or reassigned in southeast Michigan, uh, as stated by the Ford spokesperson, Jessica Enoch. And uh, one of the things, I'll put my little um, union hat on now. Sorry if you disagree with me politically. We can still be friends hat on uh, Ford are uh, because it's unionized doing having to do the right thing by those people that they are letting go and no one wants to lose their jobs but at least those who are uh, being offered packages I think they are uh, I read something around 50,000 for things like early retirement and to uh, to take you know to take a leave so that is all to do with you know collective bargaining and stuff like that like I say union hat on I'll take it off right now for the rest of the podcast well, moving on, and from the Mac E, which is hoping to get back its tax credit eligibility at some point, to the Kia EV9, which is a lovely big vehicle, uh, set for US production soon, so it should 
should get its full tax credit. Kia plans to start producing the EV9 in their West Point, Georgia facility as early as this May. Transitioning from their manufacturing in South Korea, the move to US production will make the EV9 eligible for the full $7,500 federal tax credit as long as the battery complies of course. Uh, Now it will be made in North America. The Georgia so-called Meta plant is a joint venture with Hyundai and will soon feature an EV battery manufacturing facility as well to support local battery production of the EV9 once the local battery production commences. I think that is when it gets its full tax credit eligibility rather than just half of it. Now, Kia has been preparing for the shift by running pilot production of the EV9 since early this year in that plant. And with the anticipated tax credit, the base price of the EV9 could drop to 48 Eight nine five, so less than fifty thousand dollars for a very capable three-row EV, a strong competitor against well, nothing really in EV world, at least until Hyundai bring their version of this out. Uh, so really, you're competing with combustion cars, and I think it competes at you know forty-eight eight nine five pretty well. And that leads me nicely on to a piece from Bloomberg and Tom Randall writing this for Bloomberg. He's a fantastic person to follow on social media and a great writer about these subjects as well. He knows what he's talking about. And this piece is all about the tipping point. Now, I remember reading a book about the tipping point probably 20 years ago or something. It's somewhere on the bookshelves. I need to reread it. I can picture the cover. Uh, But anyway, uh, EVs are undergoing a significant shift towards mass adoption because, and here's the key, 31 countries have now surpassed the tipping point, which is amazingly, only 5%. And it's all to do with the S curve, the S adoption curve of it going along the bottom to begin with, and then it starts to rise, and then everybody drives EVs, and then it's just the last holdout. You want to drive diesel cars to work, and that's absolutely fine. They can carry on and do that when we get to the the top of the adoption curve. And so right at the bottom of that S curve, you think it would be 20 30%, the tipping point. It's 5%. And this mark indicates the beginning of rapid adoption, historically leading to a quick rise very quickly to 25% market share within at least four years. Now, back in 2022, only 19 countries had achieved this level of EV uh, penetration. The expansion to 31 countries now uh, just highlights what a swift increase is happening in EV popularity around the world. A diverse set of markets from Eastern Europe to Southeast Asia showing this adoption tipping point. Now, for my YouTube viewers, I'll pop something on screen right now. Uh, One of the graphs from that Bloomberg article, uh, which is how fast do various countries, territories switch to EVs? If you're looking at the video version of this podcast, by the way, the uh, axes along the bottom is how many years. So it's one to 10 years after crossing the 5% threshold. So if you look at all the lines on the screen. Uh, They don't start at zero. They start at slightly above the baseline, and that is 5%. They've highlighted Germany, China in there, and uh, they've actually highlighted some a lot of countries, but in grey. But can you see they all follow the same trend? There's no real outliers. Well, despite a broader slowdown in the global car market, EVs and plug-in hybrids as well are growing, projected to grow 22% globally in 2024, indicating strong momentum, which you might have seen those headlines flying around of EV growth is stalling. And I just told you about Ford not being able to match supply and demand to their F-150 Lightning. And that's obviously a big concern for Ford. But on a global scale, the EV story still looks incredibly bright despite all of these headlines which try and tell you something different. It's because so many of the headlines are written from a US perspective and the US is actually the outlier. It's reached the 5% EV adoption tipping point at the end of 2021. But the US still lags behind other countries. And again, if you're watching video version of this, that is the US is in the the green color on this graph and you'll see it's lagging other countries. Uh, The US is behind fully electric cars, 8.1% of auto sales by the end of last year. Add plug-in hybrids and you get above 10%. But that compares to 18%, which is the average amongst 20 other countries that were at a similar stage. Well, let me change graphs 
on screen right now. And for my audio listeners, what we've done is we've moved from uh, charting how many years after crossing the 5% threshold, this new graph shows along the bottom how many it's in years from 1 to 10, how many years after crossing the 10% threshold. So, of course, the lines on the edge of the screen, the left-hand side, start further up now. And you know what? You look at this, you take a step back, You there are some variances. They're all following the same black trend line. That 5% tipping point is absolutely a real thing. And it seems like a, lo a low number to me, but once countries hit that 5% tipping point, they just start to shoot up that S-curve. Now, there is a green line on this graph, which is Norway, because they hit their 10% EV threshold 10 years ago. So that is the line that is further ahead than everybody. And they're almost at 100% EV now. There will always be edge cases. If you have commercial vehicles that still use diesel, and they'll go electric eventually. If you absolutely need to tow to your cabin in Norway and you want to do it with diesel, and there's plenty of places to charge an EV, by the way, there's a handful of people that do that. And this is all about not worrying about the last few percent because the job will be done by then. The air is cleaned up. We're all driving clean, green, uh, efficient cars. As the grids clean up as well, I mean, I charge my EV on purely 100% green energy anyway. I'm not being smug or about that, but um, but generally around the world, grids are cleaning up as well. And you can't say that about combustion cars. They will always be dirty. EVs get cleaner as the years go on. The global landscape for plug-in cars, when you add in plug-in hybrids and fully electric vehicles, shows that 27 countries have now crossed the 10% threshold 27 percent 27 countries crossing the 10 percent threshold it's it's not even up for debate anymore and it's why i no longer get stressed i've been doing this podcast i have a five over two thousand episodes every day you know, five six years before that it was a twitter account before i started actually podcasting and um and uh i used to get a bit worked up a bit annoyed about this and i i really want to honor those that still do the fight the crusade i think um fully charged we've got like a spin-off thing um with uh um uh, robert llewellyn and some others as well called stop burning stuff or stop bs and they kind of um they they attack uh, the false narratives that are out there they fact check things and i wish i had that fire in my belly anymore but now i'm just excited about evs i want to talk about the amazing evs the batteries the renewables that are coming this future that we're all gonna hope you know hopefully we're all gonna live through it, you know, my kids are going to grow up into an amazing world. Um, I'm not worried about the fight anymore because it's not up for debate. So different countries are going to go at different speeds, as we can see, the US being an outlier. And that's where a lot of the headlines are coming from. I want you to think globally. Uh, if you're not in Europe or China, I want you to think about those markets. And the US will catch up. It's just, it's a blip, if anything else. Um, as long as it can hit that inflection point, it's going to fly. And very soon it'll be at 25% before you know it. And I know it. It's going to happen. And it, it's already happening in many countries around the world. So it's not even up for debate. Will EVs, you see all the headlines. Oh, will EVs or hydrogen be the answer? It, it's going to be pure EV. I hate to, you know, spoil the party. That decision has been made by these markets. And now we're just off and running oh, off to the races. And I can't wait to see where it goes. Countries that have surpassed the EV adoption tipping point of 5% represent two thirds of the world's auto sales, indicating big progress towards global EV adoption with major markets like India, Indonesia, Poland poised to join the movement as well. I'll pop a link to that brilliant Bloomberg story and Tom's writing in the show notes if you'd like to read it for yourself. I think it's behind a paywall as well. So uh, I want to, you know, honour their work and not show you the whole article and uh, stuff. I ripped off the graph. The graph. So thank you, Bloomberg, for letting me uh, do that and get very excited about that uh, that article today. Now let's talk about a new car that is coming at least to China and. I'm sure many other places, if not this one, then one of their cars, Xiaomi, better known for mobile phones, televisions. Heck, I think my toothbrush is a Xiaomi toothbrush. They unveiled their EV. Now, we knew many of the specs from the end of last year, at least a couple of months ago. But now we know pricing, and it was a full online event over an hour long, and it's very, very competitive pricing. What we did tell you on this podcast a couple of days ago and, and what the CEO had told us, which was it's going to be less than 500,000 RMB, which is you know near 70,000 
dollars equivalent or so. Um, definitely less than that. And I thought, well, maybe they're offering wiggle, you know, giving themselves some wiggle room of being a little bit under. No, it, it, it wasn't. It's a lot under. He was absolutely playing us all and it completely worked because when they came out with the pricing, it kind of blows you away. The SU7, I think is pronounced SU7. SU stands for Speed Ultra. And in watching the presentation today, uh, they were calling it SU7. When I've, and all the English commentary I've seen calls it SU7. But I believe any of my viewers, listeners who know, let me know. I believe it's SU7. Anyway, three versions of this, and as you won't be surprised to hear, from a mobile phone company. They're called the Standard, the Pro, and the Max. Only thing they're missing is, you know, the Ultra, really. Like, you know, the M1, M3 Max Ultra chip from Apple. So I can see them doing an Ultra version at some point, because it's a mobile phone company. They're giving it mobile phone naming. Now, I'll throw up on screen some of the presentation that was live streamed while I tell you about it. And if you are watching the pictures, by the way, and I talk about this being a Tesla Model 3 beta in China or a very compelling version uh, to, to have a look at, you may be thinking that this is size wise a Model 3 car. And I, it's absolutely not. And I'll give you the dimensions in a moment. This is a Model S sized car. Uh, the Su 7 begins at 215,000 RMB. That is $29,870. This vehicle starts under $30,000 equivalent. That's 30,000 RMB cheaper than the very base Model 3. And the specs are already better. The standard and max version, so that's the bottom and the top of the range, the standard and the max arrive by the end of April. The Pro version, which is the sort of mid-range one, and I think that's the sweet spot. That's the one you want. That one is going to be delivering by the end of May. So they are ready. They're building these cars. They're going to ship them right away. The Su-7 dimensions are lengthwise 5 meters long, 4,997 uh, millimeters. That is Model S length, by the way. Width, just under two meters. It has a three meter, exactly three meter, like the Arnic 5, actually, uh, wheelbase. Wheelbase of three meters. This is a big vehicle. It looks in the pictures like it could be a Model 3 size car, but it's not. It's a Model S size car. Standard and Pro versions have a 400 kilowatt platform. And so... The bottom and the middle sit on a 400-volt platform, which is still fine. It'll still charge quickly. The max trim at the very top end is built on an 800-volt platform for quicker charging, and all three of them, Standard Pro and Max, actually have different batteries. Now, they didn't give the peak kilowatt charge rates for each of the batteries. A little annoying. They were giving it in, you know, kilometers per time. I'm going to try and do some, or at least some conversions. If I can find out what the efficiency is of the vehicle, we can work that out. Either way, um, let me tell you about this. The standard version gets a battery from BYD, so it's good stuff, and it's 74 kilowatt hours. CLTC range of 700 kilometers, that's 435 miles. CLTC is not realistic. It's wildly optimistic, even compared to, to the WLTP, especially EPA. Maybe take a third off of these numbers and you'll get into a ballpark. The Pro variant, like I say, I believe Pro is sweet spot, the middle one. Pro variant is a 94 kilowatt hour battery from CATL. Uh, this is CATL Shenxing battery, uh, which has 516 miles or 830 kilometers of range. The Max Pack is 101 kilowatt hours. That's the CATL Kirin battery. That'll have 800 kilometers of range, a little bit less, 497 miles, a little bit less, and it is the 800 volt architecture. Performance-wise, standard and pro, rear-wheel drive, 0 to 65 seconds, and just over five seconds. Max model, all-wheel drive, 2.7 2.7 seconds, 0 to 100 kph, that's 62 miles an hour. Well, the Su-7 comes equipped with Xiaomi's smart driving systems, Pilot Pro based on Vision and Pilot Max, which has LiDAR as well. Uh, the Pro system uses one NVIDIA chip. The Max system has two of the NVIDIA chips. And on screen, uh, for my YouTube viewers, you can see lots of images of this. I'd love to know what you think of this car. The styling, the exterior, it, there's elements of... 
Taycan about the side profile. There's elements of other cars. If you particularly want to be harsh to the designers, I think it's a very good design. Uh, the back end, some say, look like the, is, is, is a rip-off of the, uh, the Kia, of the Hyundai, sorry, Ionic 6. I don't see that um, personally myself, but it's had some criticism for that. Uh, front end, apparently, they've stolen McLaren's headlights, but again, I don't see that. Uh, side profile, I do see some Tycon of the side profile, but look, in all the various colours they're showing on screen right now, in all the various different angles, I think it looks great. Uh, now, the boss, Lei Jun, showcased various accessories for the new EV, and... This was a big part of the presentation, an in-car refrigerator, custom front window shades, smartphone holders, uh, uh, some of them for free, some of them if you buy the car now, some of them are additional purchases. It was like 20 or 30 accessories they spent a long time talking about. And that is interesting. I think that is something that's unique to the Chinese market, and they understand Chinese buyers. And this is, comes... To my final point on this vehicle. Look, it looks great. The performance is great. We'll see in time if it's reliable and if, if people want it. I believe they do because they had 100,000 pre-orders for this uh, very quickly after the unveiling today. And the SU7 has Apple CarPlay. It integrates with iPads as well for more connectivity options. And so uh, this is very much designed for the Chinese the Chinese market, with all those accessories to accessorize, to personalize um, your car, but also very high tech, lots of autonomy, LiDAR, ADAS systems that will drive the car itself. Um, this is very much where China Chinese buyers are and integrating with people's digital lifestyles and things like that, which some of the Western car makers haven't adapted to so quickly, which is why they're suffering a little bit. Tesla is, I think, still the aspirational brand, but this is so much cheaper, $4,000 equivalent, cheaper than even a base Model 3. By the time you go to the Pro version, which I say is the middle one of this Xiaomi, which is, in terms of pricing, the same as the base Model 3, it, they've made sure that every spec, battery size, range, performance, self-driving ability, every spec, whatever one you want to pick to play top trumps, beats the Model 3. So they're clearly going after a market with this, and we'll wait and see if Chinese buyers like it. It's a domestic name, one that they're very proud of, and uh, uh, many people have Xiaomi phones. I suspect it's going to do very, very well. Oh, it doesn't rain, but it pours for Fisker. Oh, before we move on, by the way, a reminder that if you're watching the video version of this, uh, there's an audio version like all podcasts should have, I guess, uh, which you can find. Uh, if you're a podcast listener already, I use Overcast as the app, but whether it's Apple or Spotify, iHeart in America or anything like that, uh, just search EV News Daily and you hit subscribe. It's obviously a free subscription and you can get this in your audio feed if you're not near a screen or you can subscribe to this channel for free. So you get the video version, totally up to you. Uh, I'd really appreciate you just hitting subscribe on the audio version um, so that... It helps other people find it as well. Even a review, if you use the Apple ecosystem, a little iTunes review to say, hey, yeah, you know, he's all right. Uh, that really helps out. Thank you so much. Now, Fisker, uh, the EV startup, just can't catch a break right now. A new report coming out, which it claims that they have uh, had an internal audit that lasted several months and eventually led to locating misplaced funds, but they had issues tracking millions of dollars of customer payments for the Fisker Ocean, their SUV. The audit occurred as Fisker was trying to increase the delivery rate of the Ocean. It would have been the last thing they needed to do. Uh, but this person from Fisker talking to one of the tech blogs, I think anonymously, um, talks about how the systems were not robust enough and that you know established car makers would have these systems in place. Fisker had to request new payments from some customers after the original payment methods were expired because it took them so long, sometimes weeks or months, to put through the process of the payment. And by then, they had to go back to the customer and say, oh, I know you've paid us for this. We haven't cashed the check, so to speak. Can you pay us again, please? Despite resolving the issue, the audit consumed significant resources at a time when they were trying to grow. The lost payments encompass both down payments and full purchase price 
payments for the ocean. People were paying for the vehicle, the vehicle was being delivered or they were collecting it, and the money wasn't being taken from their account. They, I don't know if, if any of them slipped through the net. Is there anyone out there driving a free Fisker Ocean who weren't caught up in this audit? There were instances where customers received their vehicles without Fisker actually taking the payment, and one of those was Consumer Reports. They actually bought a vehicle for $63,000, I believe, um, with their own money, uh, and that payment to Fisker was never processed. The company indicated they were unable to locate the payments. So, never rains, but it pours. Hey, uh, we wish, obviously, everyone at Fisker and the customers who bought those cars, looking like it's probably the end of days uh, for Fisker. Anyone that invested had a car. Uh, it's not an insignificant amount of money, is it, to buy 50, 60 grand SUV and find the people that made it might not be around much longer. I hope there's a community that springs up. I don't know what I was doing this for. Uh, that springs up, uh, that can support them with parts, uh, maintenance, software updates, open source stuff. I don't know how. I don't know how it works, but I hope. I hope it happens. Well, moving on to Polestar next, and they're introducing Polestar Charge, a new EV charging service in Europe. One of these ones from OEMs that tie together, you know, multiple tens, hundreds of different charging networks to offer one payment and you know this podcast is sponsored by um octopus electroverse which does that it puts it on your home electricity bill as well which i absolutely love because it's one bill for my energy my heating my cooking my travel it's perfect um polestar uh, not adding it to your home energy bill but are launching polestar charge Six hundred and fifty thousand public charging points will be wrapped up into this and they will integrate Tesla's supercharger network, according to this report from the industry website Electrive. That makes Polestar the very first. As far as I know, Polestar is the first European EV brand to wrap the Tesla superchargers, the open ones at least, uh, to third-party cars, into their own branded umbrella charge scheme. That's interesting. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. I have a little theory about Tesla. But there we go. Um, but the uh, the the, the uh, supercharger access means that if you are a Polestar driver, hello, I am, um, you can link a payment method in the Tesla app and uh, you can then use the superchargers via the Polestar Charge app. The charging network includes um, ENBV, RL Plus, uh, Ionity, Recharge, Fastnet, Total, Allego, and more. Polestar Charging offers a subscription, €14 Euros a month, to get you 30% off standard charging fees available in European countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Belgium, and others as well. I did read that Great Britain was going on the list of this, but as of now, I've opened my Polestar app and it's... Um, it logged me out today, uh, but there's nothing about Polestar Charge. I'll see if it's coming to the UK uh, over the weekend. I'd like to have a little play uh, with that. Now, my thoughts on Tesla opening up their network and then allowing billing, or at least being able to start charging and all that kind of stuff and billing in other people's apps. There is a theory about Tesla which doesn't often go down with the kind of hardcore Tesla investors that know the business far better than I do. But what if there is a time in the future when Tesla is more of an energy company than a vehicle company? And I only say that because the Model S is very long in the tooth. Now, the battery, the 18650 cells have been updated multiple times. The chemistry is in them. Same form factor, chemistry, all, all very different. The Plaid is incredible. Model X, incredible, but long in the tooth. Model 3 long in the tooth, needs an update. And I'm sorry, the Highland update was not an update. It was, it's interesting, but Model Y gets its update sometime, we think, this year. It's the world's number one car. They're doing nothing wrong. Cybertruck, <laughs> wouldn't be for me, but many people like it, is divisive. They're not making a cheap Model 2 car, and it's meant to start next year, but it won't, will it? And uh, it, it won't, will it? There's no sign of the Roadstar. They've made, Roadstar, they've made about 100 semi-trucks now, and uh, just the car business itself, they've talked about being in between growth phases. Uh, and as much as it, they're very good, it's the energy stuff that I get really interested in with Tesla. Like, J3400 is the new standard for the connector, in North America, they're rolling out their new V4 superchargers. They're selling that hardware, and then it's being branded by third parties. So what if Tesla 
as well as being a car company for the next decade or so, becomes a bigger player in energy and charging. And actually, the chargers that you use are all made by Tesla because they do it best. Um, and then they're branded other people. And what if the superchargers are all open and that you're using superchargers and you're using whatever, your Octopus card, your Polestar card, um, and then you're using Tesla's own superchargers. I mean, Tesla superchargers, isn't it here, not the third-party ones, but you're initiating the charge outside of that ecosystem. Uh, ultimately, Tesla win with all of that. They're making the money from the hardware. They're making the money from selling the electricity. That's The margins must be very good, probably better than selling cars. Like I say, there's a reason why I'm not paid to be a financial analyst. I'm probably way off the mark with that. It's just a little thought that I have. Right, well, three more stories before I skedaddle for the weekend. By the way, you can support the show on Patreon if you want to. You can go to patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. You haven't got to. It'll all be free. But for those people, the Patreon legends who put this show on the air, this is how I make a living now. Isn't that crazy? And um, I absolutely rely on people wanting the podcast early and ad-free. Uh, and those are just some of the benefits of signing up a Patreon or just doing it because you want to support the move to electric vehicles and you can support my work here and spreading the good word about EVs. Uh, you can be a producer, exec producer maybe, uh, 5 or dollars a month, maybe more for organisations or corporate uh, sponsorship. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who does that already. Now let's talk about Stellantis planning a 3,000 voluntary job layoff in Italy. Stellantis set to reduce their Italian workforce by over 3,000 roles through voluntary layoffs, including facilities in uh, Termoli and uh, Melfi, I think I saw, Mia Fiori, I think that was. Um, the latest agreements involving a 1,000 layoffs come after earlier announcements of uh, voluntary departures in Turin, impacting 1,500 positions, and the automaker's employment in Italy is 43,000, so 15,000 of those are in the Turin area, uh, Fiat's traditional stronghold, before they merged with, uh, with PSA to form uh, Stellantis. What do you do if you're a Chinese company like CATL who is not welcome in the US? Well, you can do a licensing deal with a company like Ford and give them your IP for a fee. So not too many Chinese boots on the ground in America, but Ford get to own that facility and use the CATL technology. Uh, that's a good way uh, around it. And if you're General Motors, you probably thought, cool, blimey, that's a pretty good deal Ford have got. We'll have some of that, please. And so that's what they've done by the sounds of this report. CL CATL in advanced talks with General Motors for a licensing agreement with uh, LFP, uh, lithium ion phosphate battery cell technology to construct a facility in North America, the planned factory aiming to match or exceed the capacity of the similar plant being developed by Ford and potential locations in Mexico as well. Under the agreement, CATL would oversee the development of battery production lines, supply chains, manufacturing, GM. Uh, those are the areas, by the way, that Ultium has... Um, <clears throat> struggled. Uh, GM would cover the factory's capital expenses. It'll be a GM project with their money and their staff. Nothing to do with China, by the way. Uh, CATL would not own a stake in the facility, but would earn money through licensing the IP patents, service fees. The business model allows CATL to invest less capital and operate on US soil. The potential GM slash CATL factory expected to start operations around 2027, following the opening of Ford's battery plant in 2026. By choosing the licensing model over direct ownership, CATL can navigate the regulatory landscapes that are a little bit bumpy, we should say. And finally, I mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, what about your EV coming with a 15-year battery warranty. Well, that's what CATL is introducing and working on a 15-year lifespan with no loss of capacity after a thousand charge cycles, working alongside NEO to push forward the development of the application of long-lasting EV batteries. Why is that important to a company like NEO? Well, NEO have battery swapping at the core of their business, so they still own the batteries. And well, it would be in your interest if you were NEO to have them lasting as long as possible. Currently, CATL supplies NEO with battery packs that have a 12-year lifespan for their battery swap stations. The 15-year batteries are uh, targeted towards, at the beginning, heavy-duty, heavy-use vehicles, buses, trucks, and more, which have a longer usage cycle than passenger cars. Uh, but NEO and CATL's goal is to ensure those batteries have at least 85% of their capacity after 15 years, surpassing what is, I think, the current industry standard, which is 70% capacity after 
the retention after maybe eight years would be pretty standard in the industry. Uh, CATL alongside NEO saying, no, let's push that to 85%. Let's push it to 15 years and give people that real peace of mind. Oh, I think we're done for the day. We might be done for the week, actually, if I'm not getting any podcasts out over the Easter weekend. If you're enjoying some time off with the family and doing things, hopefully, uh, whatever you're up to uh, this weekend. If you get a bonus podcast in your feed, then hopefully it is a, a, a bonus hopefully. Thank you very much to our premium partners, Porsche of the Village of Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, National Car Charging on the US mainland and Aloha Charge in Hawaii, Derek Riley from Nevo.ie and the Nevo EV Review Island YouTube channel, Octopus, Electroverse, Global Public Charging Made Simple with one app and one map and Lease Plan Electric Moments, all the tools and guidance EV drivers need. Have a good one. See you probably Monday. Have a good one. Oh, and remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.